Welcome back, everyone. Glad to have you here today on episode 2589 of The Cabral Concept. I'll be posting a lot of research on today's show. So if you want to check out the three big takeaways, as well as the research-based links, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2589. We're going to be going through one of the most fascinating uh, research studies right now and theories in aging. And why this matters is that if you're looking to live a long, healthy life, work on anti-aging strategies, it's absolutely helpful to know why we as humans age in the first place. So this is called the disposable soma theory, and it is by far and away one of the most, I would say, all-encompassing and uh, overall fascinating theories on aging, and the one that seems to have the most of a foothold right now, and it's because it explains so much. So one of the things that we know right now Brilliant research going on in the field. This theory was actually done in the late 70s. And before that, it was actually built off of another theory from like 1966, I believe was the original research I was looking. And so we've used this now in science. And again, many brilliant scientists are doing the work showing that we can now reverse biological aging. So they're able to reverse the age of we as humans, not from a chronological level like however old you are, let's say you're 50 years old. Well, yeah, you might still be 50 years old, right? The uh, amount of years you've been on this earth. However, what they're showing is that we might be able to turn your biology back to 40 years old. And then when you get to 60 years old, be able to turn that to maybe 45 years old. And so this is happening in our lifetime. Meaning like, again, this is why I always say, keep yourself healthy now. We need 10 to 15 more years. Like that's about it, 10 to 20 maximum more years before we can continue to reverse that biological age. I don't know how long we'll be able to do that for, but the thing is if you continue to reverse your biological age, potentially living longer, then you'll be around for all of the additional research. And so, we, But it's also about improving your overall quality of life. What I want to share with you, though, is how this research is taking place because it really has to do with the not necessarily the programming inside of the body. That was like, originally there were a lot of theories around programmed, overall programmed cell death. And that does happen within the body. But we we know now, at least theoretically, that the human body is programmed to develop, to grow, and to reproduce. And it gives priority to that. And that makes sense, right? So like, you need to grow, you need to mature, you need to be able to protect yourself on this earth, right? Like think about like outside of humans, like all species basically have to be able to do that to a degree. Then they have to be able to reproduce because if they didn't, if they weren't able to reproduce, then their species would die out and humans are really no different. So that is prioritized. Now the problem is, and we're going to go through this, but the, the basis is this. So the prioritization of the human body goes through growth, development, uh, and reproduction. Okay. Now, after that, though, and while that is happening, it then, to its detriment, forgoes some of the other processes which would keep the body alive longer. So the more it is focused on reproduction and growth and all of these things, the less it is able to do in self repair. And that's what I want to take you through today. But that is essentially the disposable soma theory. We are, we humans are disposable. We are disposable. Any time after we are able to reproduce. That's, that's basically it, right? Like it's like you needed to stay alive long enough in order to be able to reproduce. This is at a very base level. I mean, just let's keep this in mind. Stay alive long enough in order to be able to reproduce in order for these species to continue. Like that's how it has to be. And then anything after that, after reproductive base years, was bonus. That's basically how kind of nature looked at it. And so what happens is, our bodies begin to break down. They call it random tissue uh, destruction or random tissue disrepair in the disposable soma theory, meaning like anything could go wrong inside of the body because not enough attention and energy is able to be done for both reproduction, right, growth, and anti-aging at the same time. And so this natural process, which even starts like in your you know, teens and 20s, because these things are happening in the background, not the same degree. And then as you start to get a little older, to a greater degree, to a greater degree, and then the human body essentially 
breaks down from disrepair, and that's where all the inflammation is, and the inflammation leads to what? The Alzheimer's, the autoimmune issues, the atherosclerosis, all these different things that we start to see once we start to get to uh, basically even late 30s for a lot of individuals. So it's, it's very impressive, it's very interesting, and what I wanna do is just make this like really tangible. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of research study, and then I'm gonna put it into like I always call it like normal human speak in order to be able to change the vernacular uh, from all of the science and what it is. But then I'm going to link these up. Okay, so basically, um, here's a little bit of it. This is just another theory on why women live longer, but it's using the same disposable soma, and soma is S-O-M-A, uh, theory. So this was um, in uh, Journal of Aging, and basically it looks at and this is very interesting. I'm actually going to read the whole thing. It's very short, but in brief, uh, high accidental death rate is associated with faster aging in different species from worms to mammals. The same is applicable to longevity of males versus females. The accidental death rate from accidents, violence, combat is higher in young men than in women. Historically, it was much higher. Higher accidental rate in young men may have led them to be larger and stronger than women. mTOR drives cellular size growth and muscular, muscular hypertrophy including testosterone-induced hypertrophy. And by the way, mTOR, let me just take a little aside. mTOR is a mammalian uh, target of rapamycin. Uh, we'll go over that in just a moment. So um, noteworthy, rapamycin reversibly decreases levels of testosterone. So very interesting, right? I suggest that hyperactive mTOR contributes to physical robustness of young males. So the more mTOR you produce, the more robust, big muscles that you have, allowing them to fight and compete. But hyperactive mTOR is beneficial earlier in life at the cost of accelerated aging. Thus, males might age faster because TOR, targeted rapamycin, afforded strength and mass, which was beneficial in young males. In other words, accelerating aging in males relative to females could be a byproduct of physical robustness to prevent death from extrinsic causes. Males need to be more robust and healthier to survive, outcompete other males, and have a chance for reproduction. Females do not need such robustness and health to participate in reproduction, and this is why they age slower and live longer. In contrast, disposable soma theory postulates that females live longer because females need better health for reproduction. All right, so they go on just a little bit more, but I want to read one more passage. Eating less or calorie restriction prolongs lifespan in most animals and prevents age-related disease in humans, thus expanding lifespan. So they go on, actually, I won't read this whole thing. They go on to basically discuss that uh, mTOR could be one of the largest factors in aging. And I've explained this a little bit more before, a little bit. I'm going to link up a podcast here today. So if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash 2589, I basically give you the, there's an inverse to everything in this amazing world that we live in. So it's kind of like when we're, we're talking about um, anxiety and not being able to sleep and even like high blood pressure. Well, if you have higher levels of calcium in the body, and that could be from stress, drying it from your bones, et cetera, uh, versus magnesium, well, then you can be more sympathetic nervous system dominant. You know, we start to use a little bit of magnesium. Oh, okay, we start to slow the sympathetic nervous system process. Again, you still want to get the underlying root cause, but like that's how things work. Okay, you have higher levels of copper in your body. Um, what happens? Well, you might feel more allergies, skin rashes, ADD, ADHD, uh, those types of things. Uh, and then if we add more zinc, zinc pushes down copper and it helps to balance that with the immune system. And like, so again, there's always an inverse, right? So what I'm trying to share with you is that there's always an inverse. So if you are in your reproductive stage or an older adult and maybe even saying, hey, let me take a lot of the uh, testosterone replacement hormone therapy and I'm taking testosterone, or you, I'm not personally taking testosterone, I'm just be one of those people. But let's say you're taking testosterone, you're taking growth hormone, and you feel great. Like, I don't disagree with you. Like, that's the thing is like, you will most likely feel great. I just want to share that with you. And I have no problem with that. Like, I actually, I have so many people in my practice that are on TRT because they know that it is not my job to tell them whether they should be on TRT or not. It is my job to help them stay as healthy as humanly possible. It is their decision to be on testosterone replacement therapy, and I fully support them because they are a human and they are allowed to do as they choose, as long as they are not doing harm to others. And so that's my, my, um, my goal is I have to help them. That's, that's what I do. But what I then have to do is share with them how do we offset that? Because if you have high levels of testosterone, you're taking even growth hormone, 
And you have, you know, again, you're taking in larger amounts of protein and calories as well because you're supporting the growth of your muscle mass, right? Well, you've got now higher mTOR, right? So that muscle growth, just think of it that way. You've got higher IGF-1 and growth hormone. You've got higher sex hormones. What does that mean? Well, we just read it. What it means then is there's less repair for DNA. There's less repair overall for tissue, although testosterone can help with the overall recovery process. The immune system may not have the same level of repair. You may get more atherosclerosis, which can be seen at higher levels, super, physio super physiological levels of testosterone. Uh, there may not be much, as much repair of the brain. Maybe there leads to dementia or Alzheimer's. And then there isn't as much autophagy. And autophagy is the overall repair of the body and removal of a lot of cancer cells. So we have to understand is that promoting the robustness of youth and reproduction through the sex hormones uh, and even growth hormones, things like that, may be detrimental to the long life goals that people may have. So what I think that we're going to find is that there's a happy medium. But I will share with you this. Current research shows that those people with the lowest levels and low levels of IGF-1, meaning growth hormone, seem to live the longest. So there is definitely this correlation between having less growth hormone and being able to live a longer life. But there's absolutely a sweet spot because you still need some level of growth hormone and you know testosterone or other hormones in your body in order to feel the energy and the robustness and repair of life. So that's what we're gonna find. We're not there yet. But this is an interesting theory to keep in mind because until we have, I always tell people like, err on the side of caution because whenever you, you can do things to feel amazing. If you drink coffee on an empty stomach, you know, you boost those adrenaline levels, those stress hormones in your body. There, that comes at a cost, right? It absolutely comes at a cost. And it could be just creating a more catabolic environment inside the body, uh, lowering metabolism over time, stressing the nervous system, depleting minerals, like it comes at a cost. So what I'm saying is when you're taking hormone replacement therapy as well, you really want to do that in a balanced manner. You still want to probably include your intermittent fasting because a lot of people, as they're trying to put on, let's say, as much muscle tissue or muscle mass as possible, on just expanding their, you know, current sarcoplasm or the uh, the actual um, myofibrils, like the myofibrin of the muscle itself, the tissue and or the actual fluid inside the muscle, they're eating uh, and they're not fasting as much because it's not as conducive. Like the truth is, if you fast 12, 14, 16 hours a day, it's not as conducive to put it on muscle as if you don't fast more than 12 hours a day. Like that's the truth because you, when you're fasting, you're not in as much of an anabolic state. So it's easier to stay leaner, but not as easy to put on muscle mass. So what see, there seems to be though, that at least in our practice, is that we're able to find the sweet spot of balance, whether you're doing natural methods of boosting testosterone or growth hormone through sleep and exercise, et cetera, and, and certain herbs and products, um, but not going overboard still including the intermittent fasting, still being able to take advantage of autophagy, to be able to take advantage of cellular cleanup and, and get that great sleep and reduce overall stress levels. I also think that why it's interesting because the, the last part that looks like it actually goes against this disposable soma theory is that eating less food, less calories overall, extends lifespan. And it's been shown in, in everything, basically, to, for that to be the case. Now, the reason why it looks like it almost refutes it, though, is because the body needs nutrients in order to be able to repair the body. And it's getting less repair when it's in more of that reproductive stage rather than in the repair stage, the anti-aging. So what they found, though, is that the, there is a balance. By eating too much food, you're expending more energy, you're pushing yourself more into that mTOR-based state, Eating too few calories is not good either because you don't get enough nutrients. But again, it's that sweet spot of eating just a little below what you need, essentially, that you're not expending all of the energy that you need, in, that it takes in calories to break down food, but you are getting enough nutrients for the body. It may also be why uh, 
science is showing that people taking a methylated, like a good activated multivitamin, something like our daily nutritional support that we use or another functional medicine-based product, that people are extending lifespan. And it could be because if you're doing intermittent fasting, you've lowered your calories, you're not overdoing it, but you're getting in the micronutrients that your body needs to repair, that might be one theory. That could be one reason why. We don't always know. The science, it takes a little while for it to catch up in science as to what we know works. It's why I always talk about getting in enough micronutrients today, even if you're not getting in all the macros that you need if you are dieting for one particular reason. So it's very fascinating work. I brought this up to you today is to say, because I know so many people right now are doing hormone replacement therapy. I just ask you that if you're doing that, to do it for the right reasons, first look for all the underlying root causes as to why your hormones might be low in the first place, because really your hormones shouldn't be that low until you get into your like mid-60s to late 60s as they start to really decline. So I'd be careful with starting to do things, especially if you're any younger than your mid-60s, especially even younger than 60 at all. And then Another part to that is this, is that you're working with somebody who's really qualified if they're going to be giving you a hormone replacement therapy. That they're not just giving you one injection a month and having it spike really high and then by the end of the month it comes down all the way. That is not how the human body works with natural physiology. You're most likely going to be giving, giving yourself a little bit of a boost a couple times a week. And so you kind of stay at baseline. But also testing your hormone levels, doing something like the stress mood and metabolism lab or even just a single base biomarker based lab um, in order to make sure that your numbers are good, that they're not super physiological. The super physiological means not producing more than the body would ordinarily produce, um, you know, even at a youthful age. Because maybe you're 45, maybe you're 50, and, and you're taking some type of hormone replacement therapy. Okay, but is that is that even higher than you would have had at 18 years old, 20 years old? And if it is, certainly I believe that that's going to cause detriment to the body in the long run. We see so many people now with heart-based issues, et cetera, uh, who are using hormone replacement therapy. And for the most part, you know, they're just so much larger than their normal physique would ever have allowed for. And unfortunately, this could be, this could be one of those particular reasons why. It's, it's most likely not the only thing. Uh, it's most likely the increased strain in the body, uh, on the organs. It is the increase in mTOR. It's the increase in food and overall protein that they're taking. And again, I'm not discounting hormones and protein, all those things we do. We need those things. But what I'm always preaching is not moderation, but balance. We need to balance your physiology for you. That's why I'm such a huge advocate of actually running your own at-home labs, finding out what it is you need. You can run these at-home labs with your naturopathic doctor. You can run them with an integrative health practitioner level two. You can run them with Equal Life. Um, you can always find these things in you're able to actually say, am I balanced or not? And if not, what is the underlying root cause as to why I'm not? So I wanted to share this with you here today. You'll be hearing a lot more about DST or disposable somatherapy. But in summary, it is essentially the body prioritizes in the beginning youth and growth and reproduction which is mTOR, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all these things, and taking in more and more calories to be able to fuel the body. And then while that is happening, the body then slowly begins to break down over time. And there is just not enough energy or energy utilization to be able to do both. And so while you're prioritizing reproduction, then the body is becoming, it's starting to become inflamed and broken down and then it leads to what's called inflammation. And you probably heard that as well. So I'll link up a few podcasts, one on inflammation, one on mTOR, one on autophagy, and then I'll link up a little bit of the research here for today. So hopefully this was helpful. Of course, if it was, do feel free to share the show with anyone you believe it could serve. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.